Hello and welcome to the DM's Book Club, a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. I'm your host for today. My name is Ben, for long-time lister, second-time guest. Yep. <laughs> and uh, as ever, I am joined by the wonderful and amazing Fiona. How are you today, Fiona? I am very well, Ben. Wow, that was bloody seamless. You should be like a radio host. I feel like I've been su- usurped. Yeah, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, no. you just gave me such good notes. To I did. On. I did give you good notes. It's the same line I always use, and you made it infinitely better with your personality. I'm very well, thank you. I'm. It's been very rainy in the UK. Uh, so obviously, for the listeners at home, we're we're in separate countries, separate time zones, even, which is very exciting. But yeah, here in the UK, it's very. It's definitely gone from end of the summer into straight autumn so all the leaves are on the ground but it's raining and it's that sort of rain where you're like do i need a coat (sighs) oh i need a coat you know that sort of like well i guess it's umbrella season you know so that sounds delightful i love rain like that it's delightful if you're prepared for it, but if you're like me who never has a coat because it's like it's just an extra thing to oh, carry. Yeah. Oh wait, sorry, you've been leaving the house? Oh sorry, <laughs> I totally misunderstood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're in, indoors going, well, this is lovely looking outside, and then you see, oh, that poor person that's walking, oh god, I hope they're okay. That person is me. <laughs> like going, fuck, <laughs> no coat. <laughs> Well, see if you can guess what country I'm in, dear listener. I am looking out also on a rainy day. It's mm. grey. There are lots of clouds over the fjord. Oh, mm. uh, <laughs> uh, uh, very nice, very nice. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's delightful weather. Grey and cold in a way that it hasn't been for a while. And that's very mm. nice. A breath of fresh air. Yeah, well, we were discussing just off podcast now that you had somebody that comes in to check your fire alarms for you, but it sounded very like a very big procedure and stuff, which was <laughs> really yeah. We get crazy. you get a you get a note through your door like a two weeks in advance that says someone's gonna. Bu- I think people are very scared of anyone buzzing their door unexpectedly. So it says you're gonna get your door buzzed between these hours, and a bloke's gonna come up and he's gonna test all of your smoke alarms. He's gonna <laughs> go into every room in your house, push all of the buttons, give you any batteries you need the, the, to replace them, and then he's gonna find your fire extinguisher, which you're required to have in your cupboard, and he's gonna turn it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's going to put it back and leave. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, again, it just feels like a proper ritual. <laughs> like this once a year, he comes, but we don't know when, but we have a note so soon. <laughs> <laughs> I do look forward to the human contact once a year. <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely does sound not in the UK. <laughs> like, I think people would just be like, um, test your fire alarms. Have you? No. Uh, do you have batteries? No. Fire extinguisher? I've taken it with me. Yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> Sold that. Made a quick buck. It was good. Yeah. Oh, free fire extinguisher from this person's house. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about today, Fee? What have you brought to the table for us? What, what have I... Uh, I wish if people could see that I could just like pull up like various tomes and, and things. Go, right. Well, today, listeners. So... I guess a bit of a culture shock as well. So we are diving into a book we've not discussed previously on the DMs Book Club. Well, there's two books that it comes from, but specifically we're going to look into Candlekeep Mysteries, which was a, an adventure module that sort of came out a couple of a couple of years ago now, but it was from people in the D&D community who created uh, various one-shots because people were asking for one-shots. But the real reason we're talking about that today is because we want I want to talk about a location that is in the Forgotten Realms in Faerun called Candlekeep. This sort of amazing repository of lore and knowledge that everyone comes to just off the Sword Coast. And I just found it a very fascinating read because I just felt like more often than not, when we're doing our campaigns and stuff, there's always like, well, we need to go get some knowledge from somewhere or we need to get a new mission or something like that. A lot of the times you go see one person in a guild, you know, or you go to uh, the tavern and that's where you get your information from and and all your research. And maybe there is a, a local library or a bookstore. But what if you could have access to the biggest library of everything in your campaigns and what would that look like? So I thought we'd just have a have a quick look at how it's sort of described in Candlekeep Mysteries. And I will say that it's also used in Sword Coast Adventures Guide as well, but it has been adapted from there as well. Yeah, definitely more fleshed out here in the Candlekeep Mysteries. There's actual stat blocks for all the NPCs that you'll encounter and things like that. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, definitely appreciated that. So uh, yeah, what what is Candlekeep going to be like to the adventurers to the players when they first arrive? What are they going to see and experience? 
And so there was this very interesting way of describing it, which I absolutely love. There's definitely an eye-catching silhouette. So when it's sort of the, the sun comes up on this place, it's basically a huge fortress that is on a crag looking over the, uh, the sort of the Emerald Sea, I think it's called. But they describe it as, if you imagine a cake with too many candles, and that instantly, I'm like, this is amazing. I want, I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> this white like fortress with huge walls, but then there are all these towers coming out of it, essentially. There's only one way in and out through a place called, I think it's called like the old... You know, the Way of the Lion? The perhaps? Way of the Lion. Yes, that is correct. So like, yeah, this Way of the Lion, so that's the only way in and out from the sort of outside world. And it's pretty remote as a result. So the idea that this is... A defensible place. This is where all the knowledge is kept and it will be defended at all costs as a yeah, result. Definitely uh, made me think of that castle fortification. I think it's in South France where it's also, it's on a peninsula and the whole island is kind of this walled in, slowly yes. spiraling fortress. It's just like that, you know, this peninsula, very defensible, very yes. remote and isolated, braving What's against that? the ocean. Yeah. That was used in a TV show, wasn't it? Where it was a bit like oh, Crystal <laughs> like... Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't, I'm going to embarrass myself if I try and remember what it's called. But if you Google Peninsula Castle, I'm small, sure. France. <laughs> small Castle France. Yeah. The big thing I love about this is that within this sort of let's call it for what it is an administration building, there are various sort of systems about like who goes in, who goes out, how the books are received, and basically how you can interact with this. And I just like. The idea that we're having these buildings that have, this is how they work on a day-to-day setting. So when your adventurers come bumbling in saying, we need something, it's not a simple transaction between the shopkeep to give you the book. There's actually a couple of other steps that they have to take. So, so for example, to gain admission to this place, there's no cost per se. All it is is that you need to offer a gift of a book that they mm. currently don't have in their collections, which I love because then it says, Obviously, you know, they have quite a lot of their books. So many people come with multiple books to see yes. if they can gain that one. I love the idea of the, the pilgrims on the on the road over the peninsula just burdened down with all kinds of scrolls and, and pamphlets and books trying to find something unique just so they can get inside. It's exactly. Great. I just, yeah, I love the idea of that. Have you got the Da Vinci Code? No? Okay. Uh, like, no, not that <laughs> we one. We don't want that one anyway. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's like, yeah, because in, in the UK, many years ago, just so many Da Vinci Codes got donated to bookshops, uh, to charity shops, that they said, we don't want any more of them. <laughs> we have too many of these books. Uh, uh, the bit I would have latched onto as a player mm-hmm. was the reference to the idea that it could just be a journal of an adventurer that contains unique stories and and just that the the fact that you as as players could commission someone or maybe you've got like a bard in the party or something you show up and you've done five levels worth of you know campaigning and you say hey look we wrote it all down we went and slayed this guy and we went and did this thing over here and it's all written down and mm-hmm. to use that for admission just sounds it sounds great yeah so uh, they also accept like rare edition of tomes that they already have they said journals that recount unique and or insane experiences or odd works that have been uh, annotated by a prominent scholar outside the library and that makes me so cross <laughs> the idea that like here's this book but it's been written in no i think uh, by this person i'm like no i think ryan would defend that quite uh quite <laughs> he would happily. he would think that's an excellent idea so i'm just like ah as a result but once granted visitors will quickly discover that that it is wise to assemble like a wish list so that they if they're on the lookout for certain books they can sort of you know, be able to gather these books for future readmissions because that is it. It's one book per time you are there. So rather than a one book and you're in, it's like no, no, no. Every time you're in, the terms of sort of your your stay because it is kind of like you know you travel to this place and you stay there for a ten a day, so for at least ten days, and then when you leave, you're not allowed back in for a month or so. So when you're there, it is. I do imagine it to be almost like a, a library version of Butlins that you go uh, for a certain period to do your research to get the information you need and then to leave and then come back again should you wish as a result yeah when I was reading that section I just had these ideas of like is it called west marches or green marches or something the idea of having a kind of hub world structure to a series of one shots Mm -hmm. I just thought it would be a really good idea to use candle keep as your hub because they're saying hey um we need this 
diary of a lich. Uh, so can you go fight the lich in his dungeon, kill it, grab its diary and come back? back. Yeah. And then, you know, you can use the candle keep as a kind of hub world where you get a little bit of information about some overarching story, but mm-hmm. you can kind of throw in whatever one shots you want to mm-hmm. get these unique works that they're requesting on their wish list. Mm-hmm. It really resonated with me that section as like a, a really good way to kick off a series of adventures while having a place for the players to come back to and want to come back to and have reason to come back and explore a little further. Yeah, really uh, yeah absolutely. Yeah, because yeah, I think it is called West Marchers, that campaign where it basically is the GM's always there, but the, the players themselves, they can interchange. So it could be a completely different band of players that go out week on week. And yeah, that makes total sense for this. So you're not necessarily, it's not a guild where you're going to go off and slay the monsters. It's a guild to go recover relics or something like that. So it's a different purpose to it, which I really It's just really so like. flexible, you know, you can, mm. you can have whatever story, so long as at the end of it, there's just something written down that these guys want. You can do anything in that one shot. When you're there, there's sort of the people that are sort of living there. There's about 300 people that sort of look after this and maintain the day-to-day stuff. And they're called, they're simply called the avowed. So that it is essentially like, um, depending on the law and stuff like that, it talks about this idea of a temple of knowledge and like having the idea of keeping sacred knowledge. So it is, does feel a bit like a, of a devout sort of order that you, you apply to get into as, of, as an avowed. But uh, when you are admitted to Candlekeep, you can ask to get a, a guide of some sort or a research assistant. So you're not just on your own trying to discover the book you need, which are quite like, and of course, as we all know, was of the coast, they love their tables. And you can just, if you wanted to make up a guide, you can do, but there's some here, you've got like a spring summer foot, who is a halfling with ink stained fingers and a small bag of cookies and a good memory for recipes. So instantly in that, you got a, a wonderful. This was a masterclass in how to, how to give the DM 10 words that can create 10 hours of content yeah. the, the amount that players will take a small bag of cookies in one pocket and a good memory for recipes yeah. and end up like opening a bakery with this person and needing to go on missions to equip them i mean it, it's a wonderful table full of tiny little details so succinctly expressed i loved it it was really good and yeah and they're all all the descriptions of them are different obviously you've got different ages different races i think my favorite one is the one at the end so irony a 15 year old Tiefen scribe who follows the rules, never lies or steals, and aspires to be keeper of the tomes one day. So, big aspirations, uh, but obviously very young, very dedicated, and stuff like that. So, I quite like that as a, as like, you know, if you're, as, as we all know with our, our sort of players, it's that like, it's a bit of comical that, oh, we, we can steal a book. I can imagine the irony going, no, you can't. <laughs> Please don't, you know. <laughs> so, playing that, that, that character char- like that. That character description was the one where I, I most was like, oh, this could really go uh, into a multi-session thing where you see mm-hmm. irony's kind of experience within candle keep grow yes. and change mm-hmm. especially with a name like irony it's just begging for yeah. a revelation that someone higher up the chain has slowly been stealing books because i think that the, this section does also include a little bit on the theft protection yes. if we can talk a little more about that that's uh, uh quite absolutely a so I've, we have such an a place of reputation there are going to be magical defenses to protect it you know some of it is just like literally we're protecting the books from mold weevils and other threats but other things can be more dramatic so there is a magic restriction so you can't enter uh, candle keep without you know other than through the front gates if you try to teleport in if you try to fly in you can't get past sort of this magical shield per se and you're not hurt in any way you just appear at the gates still you can't go in so you can't say pick a stone from the courtyard and just appear in it it is just like oh whoops that sort of thing there is a weakness to it however which i quite like is the idea that you can see birds flying over this place because we are obviously uh, at a hilltop per se hilltop we are at a cliff top so realistically you could transform yourself into a small bird and get in that way but nobody ever talks about it because why would they <laughs> why would they but you could make that conclusion as a result yeah um, i really like that throughout this uh, content they do kind of point out flaws yeah. In, in these protections. I think that's really nice because, and then they're also the flaws that your, your players are most likely to kind of reason out uh, because you're probably going to describe a bird or they're going to ask yeah. and then they can kind of come to these conclusions. So I, I really like that they put that in there. And and they could have they could have said like, oh, but of course, if if you've transformed yourself into a bird, 
the magic nose and it transforms you back. But no, they left it in. They let you do it. And I think yeah. that was that was really nice. Because that, that is clever. Because again, it's that sort of thing that's just unspoken, but it allows, yeah, you know, like you said, your players to figure it out. And a lot of times when you are DMing, yeah, it's that sort of thing where the players, well, can I do this? And your head is like, oh no, there's there's nothing in the notes on that. Uh, I guess so. Whereas now it's like, this is gonna happen to you. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> like it's also a, a great, a great setup for what a villain might want to do, not necessarily the yes. players, but if you've done a few sessions in Candlekeep, kind of maybe they've made some friends because it does say, I think that eventually um, if you're, uh, I can't remember what their term, but essentially someone who's well connected to the Candlekeep, you've helped them a lot before. You mm. don't have to keep bringing something new, but it's done usually out of respect. So if you're at that kind of level where you're, mm. you're a friend of the avowed, then maybe it's time to start putting Candlekeep itself in peril, have mm. something fly in and start infiltrating, trying to steal, set some fights actually inside the inner sanctum and stuff. Yes. That could be really cool. That'd be really interesting. Yeah. Like again, if you're doing that sort of idea of that, that West March thing, and later on you say, like, well, you maybe you don't have a like a mission to go on. You're like, hey, it is the end of year feast. And they're like, wait, people are at the gates. People are going to try and take in and stuff like that. So how are they getting in? Yeah. really like that. You got other things like fire suppression. So only uh, flames are candle light can happen. So there's no huge flames. You're not suddenly going to burn the place down, but this is the one you were referring to uh, theft protection. So every book scroll and other work that is part of the collection is magically protected against theft. So if you go and like basically put a book in your bag and leave, it just disappears and returns to its proper place in the library, which <laughs> is great. And it's like, you maybe have left it on, like oh, I'll just take it from the you know stealing it from a table and it actually no we're going to file it away here because that's where it belongs. But again, it is not a um, it is not a foolproof sort of thing. Is that you can you can again for me shockingly, but you can tear a page out or tear parts of the book out and it won't reappear. Uh, I'm not sure Ryan would even defend that. I don't no, think he's I just not. in favor of putting notes in. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it makes me feel like so sick. But again, it's not talked about. So hopefully your players won't think that. But maybe that's just me as a as a, a person rather than DM. The other thing is that you're allowed to make notes about stuff, but you can't copy huge chunks out. You, if you were going to do that, you have to buy um, or commission uh, a service from the avowed themselves to do that, which can cost quite a lot of money and take a lot of time. So there's all these other ways about, again, it's just like if you were researching your own projects in your university library, essentially. But yeah, that makes me feel so ill. Just the idea is like, I'll just, I'll just tear it out. Does anyone see me? And you're like, I see you. I see you for what you really are. <laughs> just the way it describes it. Similarly, if a work is split into pieces and entirely removed from Candlekeep, only the largest piece disappears and returns to its proper place in the library. It's just asking for you to do something with that. They, you know, they wouldn't put yes. that in if they didn't want you to, to ma make that actually matter. Mm -hmm. And so it just immediately makes you think, who's doing that and why? And what are they going to do when they've got... 2,000 pieces of paper that are all torn up that they've slowly extracted and they have to try and piece back together this evil book to cast a summoning spell or something. I, it's great. Really good bit oh, of flavor. God, yeah, could, yeah, could you imagine that? Like every time, every like over the years, somebody comes in and just takes one page from the same book until eventually they have it all. And then it's like, all right, this is 20 years of work. <laughs> I, I can now summon that lich. Like Probably should have just forked over the 200 gold to get them to copy it, but... <laughs> That leaves an actual paper trail as you just taking the stuff is totally yeah. fine. And then finally, in terms of sort of wards, is that uh, sort of almost like a last uh, resort. The Keeper of the Tomes will activate a shield of some sort. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it a Mithral? I guess. Mithal? Mithal? Yeah, it's like a, a huge unbreakable magic effect which envelops the whole of Candlekeep in like a protective shield through which nothing but air and sound can pass through. So pretty much like um, a cube of force, essentially, but over the whole fortress, essentially. And I, what I like about that is that it reminded me very much of like if you've ever seen um, Galathrae in Doctor Who or something like that, huge idea of a huge mm. bubble that nothing goes in, nothing goes out. And that's the thing, is that it's not necessarily preventing things from coming in, but it's, a, you know, we have a thief among us, uh, or there's something, there's been a murder, it's about, right, beep, nobody leaves until we find out who it is. And just having that locked room scenario. Oh, I didn't even think about that. I was just thinking about it in terms of, you know, as a dragon and we got to stop them burning down the keep, but the idea of a locked room mystery, that sounds great. Mm, in a huge fuck off library as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, as you sort of refer to as well, there are some rules as well, as all good libraries do. Uh, no fighting, no stealing, no copying, as we sort of mentioned, and no damaging, marking, or otherwise modifying the works. So even though, you know, you can obviously gift a journal that or, or a, um, a thing that has has notes in it, you can't add to these books, which makes me feel so much better <laughs> as a result. <laughs> just imagine the faux pas of you've handed over your adventures and then you're like, oh, I just wanted to add yeah, this. No. No, slap the hand away. No, how dare you? It just <laughs> happened. I want to put it in there. I just met no. you. <laughs> no. So yeah, so then going on to uh, so the people that are around the avowed, essentially. So like I said, there's about 300 of them living in this place. And most of them are just research assistants or scribes that handle everyday work. You know, they are newish to maybe you know a couple of years or something like that but there are things like high ranking members so the ones we've also sort of referred to so the keeper of tomes is the highest ranking member and basically the governor of candlekeep who selects things and, and basically does the whole sort of workings around candlekeep itself so their word is law and each sort of ruling that they do is recorded as it would do because it is a library <laughs> uh, for future keepers Here's the interesting thing, though. They choose their own replacement unless they die. And then you have the Council of Great Readers, these sort of eight uh, folks that have been sort of picked, elevated to this position, who can then uh, determine the next one. But I love the idea that, you know, someone's word is law, but after so many years, you know, things don't change or anything like that, but they're constantly picking those who fit their right ideals and stuff. It's quite interesting. It does lend itself a little to some kind of politics play, which I always struggle with, but at least here you've got to good structure where it just lists these are the eight people that would would be in that vote mm-hmm. so you can kind of begin to piece together maybe maybe who they're going to vote for or, or work around it in some way so mm. i like the structure they've given here it is mm. it is good and then you have also something called the first reader who i like to see as sort of maybe the head of the council who essentially uh, they're the ones that are expanding the literary resources and the base of knowledge so any any new tomes or anything like that they will go under their review first so you have and it talks about this a little bit in sword coast adventures guide that that there is possibly an antagonistic relationship between the first reader and the keeper of the tomes. Possibly. They don't have to be, but I do like that idea that in order to expand and be more creative and stuff like that, you'd have that sort of thing against someone who goes, no, we can't afford it. No, that's not how we do things. That's sort of uh, ruling, as it were. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that kind of system in the real world as yeah. well, where you have, you know, one person's job is to push you in another di- in one direction and the other person is to try and pull you back and you kind of land somewhere in the middle and it's more kind of stable and, and quite an effective way to run things, mm-hmm. often, not always. Mm-hmm. So I kind of like that they included that here. But what is a chanter that we haven't talked about yet? Oh, yes. Yeah. So one thing we've got to talk about is that this place, Candlekeep, uh, was originally, I guess, a homestead or somewhere where, and I'm going to say this wrong for sure, is it Alondo the Seer, who is a very, yeah, Ben's nodding, sure. Alondo, <laughs> sure, yeah, I don't Alondo, know. Um, who is a great prophet and would write down several different prophecies and stuff. And so what they, what they do, there is someone called the Chanter, who is a, a, there's a chosen group of avowed that maintain the constant sort of reciting of these prophecies. And they'll go around traveling day and night around the whole <laughs> candle keep, chanting these things. And it's just known as this endless chant. So you could be, you know, in the courtyard, you could be in the tavern, and you could just hear them outside chanting, whatever it is. Again, it doesn't really say, it doesn't give any clues to what uh, certainly in this part of the, the book, maybe it says it elsewhere, what kind of chance they would, would do. But no doubt your players will be like, oh, so what are they saying? And that for me, I'll be like, I will just make everything up at this point. <laughs> and it will be yeah. very silly. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's explored in any of the actual one shots in the book, but I thought that the general candle keep section was slightly lacking in what are the prophecies? You know, like what what, what are they about? Are it, they known? We could have definitely done with a table here. You know, oh, yes. <laughs> you know, like this is this is wizards. You missed an opportunity to put a table in your book. <laughs> <laughs> heavens um, for fend. Heavens for fend. But yes, and, and I think that again is that interesting thing because this is another part which later on actually there is uh, they talk about there are these gemstones that have almost like pre-recorded prophecies from uh, Alunda the Seer that are found beneath the uh, the fortress itself but both the keeper of the tome and the first reader pay no mind to them because they're always inaccurate 
<laughs> so it feels a little bit like Terry Pratchett in a way. This idea is like, well, these are, you know, these are artifacts. Like, yeah, but they're completely wrong. <laughs> Tweak your interpretation to make it suit the agenda that you have. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think you're right. I think useful. actually, yeah, it's, it's, they're not completely inaccurate. They're just wildly open to interpretation. So they're like, yeah. we're not, we're not going to Al- trust this. <laughs> Alawando's prophecies are easily misinterpreted, which is why the first readers and keepers of tombs rarely consult or take advantage of the echoes. It's, you know, I'm pretty sure he said this. Can't we just listen to the recording? Oh, no, no. No, no. It's too easy to misinterpret. Let me tell you what we're doing. And actually going back to other sort of, um, as you were saying, that sort of idea of the um, avowed uh, guides, there actually is a small box talking about one specific, not necessarily a guide, but sort of a, a resident minor character which could be useful for handing out missions or something like this one uh, it's a box called the little one which is essentially a an ogre who's wearing a headband of intellect and there's a little backstory to him where he killed a adventure halfling wearing this uh, gold help uh, wearing this gold headband and then when he attuned to it he realized uh, the error of his ways and i was like wanted to seek out a better life and so came to candlekeep to learn as much as he could and so i love that Again, changing that expectations because suddenly you're seeing an ogre possibly sitting in the tavern reading a, a very small book on something, and they are they're lovely. Oh. They t- like like he says, oh, he's currently reading Storm King's Thunder, and he will happily chat to you about books, and then he will give you a rare book, you know, if you want to, you know, and he doesn't mind sharing stuff. So that idea of like, I just think a very rich. Again, what I like about this whole section is that even in just a paragraph or two, you have such a rich minor character that your players will be like. We want to talk to this guy. We want to talk yeah. to the ogre. Absolutely. If you include that in your description, if you say, you know, it's a, it's a tavern, there's a barkeep, uh, floors are a little dirty, there's someone sweeping, and there's an ogre in the corner reading a book, <laughs> yeah, of course yeah. you're going to go talk of to him. Of course you're going to go and talk to him, even though most, I guess, most people will be like, well, we can't talk to them. You know, you might look fervently and then go, excuse me, but you're an ogre. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, I think that's, I, I just think that's a really cool story hook uh, to be like, you've arrived at the tavern, which is called the Hearth in Candlekeep. And again, going on to that, actually, the, the Hearth itself and quite a few of the other places in Candlekeep, they have um, what I call the TARDIS effect, that they're bigger on the inside. Mm. You have various sort of like spells, giving them the extra dimensional space. And it's interesting, you could host quite a lot of things. It sounds like the perfect place to live, I've got to be honest. Um, you can get meeting rooms, you can get decent food there's bath houses and there is a again another small box somewhere which says um most of these ex- extra dimensional spaces in the towers which we'll come on to are marked but some of them have been forgotten about and you know if you stumble across them everyone would try and detail what is in them and catalog them and if they are of no use they'll be dispelled so again an adventure where you get lost in the library and you have to find your way out oh, oh this door wasn't here before and that sort of um, room of requirement type idea, like it's yeah. always there when you need it. So yeah, one thing I, I I understand why it's not there, but I wish maybe was explored is the history of Candlekeep, the place. It's mm. maybe in some of the one shots or something. It's like why was it founded? I know it mentions somewhere later on that the candle towers are actually they've been transported oh. from various places. I can't remember if that was in this one or in Sword Coast Guide, but that each tower is from like a different civilization or a plane or whatever. And they've been cobbled together to make this hodgepodge effect. And so that's why there's also all these extra dimensional things inside. And Mm -hmm. and it sounds like it was all kind of lost to time at some point. Mm -hmm. And so just rich for opportunity to put some ancient magics in uh, some stories involving, I think they says at one point, one of the towers is actually the body of a dead ancient red dragon, dragon. or something. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. It's, it's interesting, that idea of like, in my head, just like, oh, it's just loads of candles. But actually, each individual candle is clearly from other birthdays, you know, <laughs> that sort of <laughs> way yes. it looks. Um, but you're right. Yeah, looking at it now, yeah, piecemeal from other locations and then painstakingly reassembled to create this sort of all these different spires with different uh, 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 different sort of architectural styles and that there are uh, like rope bridges between them and sometimes you see um, scribes going back with huge big bits of books like I can imagine just almost like again I can't remember the place for what it's called but um, the Greyjoy fort in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire just going over this rickety bridge in the rain with all these books <laughs> like, it's, like, uh, it's but I think the key thing I saw um, there's two things I saw about these towers obviously this idea that all these towers different sizes and stuff but they are honeycombed inside all these different reading rooms and stuff which have permanent silent spells put on them 
Mm. And I'm like, that is genius. <laughs> so that's the idea that you can't shout or anything like that. Everything's dead quiet, so you're able to read. And I think it's said as well in um the place of rest where you can mm. bunk up is that if you're, you know, that is also meant to be quiet. So if you're a bit rowdy, go to the tavern instead, which I can imagine eventually that's where I would end up as if I was playing this game. But you have that idea of the silent stuff. You have continual flame spells that sort of light up uh, the, again, you can just imagine like corridors of corridors of books, uh, floating candles. There's drift globes as well for visiting remote sections where you'd be like, well, we can't waste a, a spell on here. But then the most important thing is that there are librarians who are modrons. And that is, <laughs> as soon as I saw the word Modrons, I thought we are going to talk. You know, I want to say, as a long-time listener, I fully support your love and fascination for Modrons. I, yes. I really wanted to introduce it in a previous campaign, but sadly that campaign stopped before I could. But I just bloody love the whole mechanists and Modrons and these little droids. And, oh, it's just wonderful. So... And this is the thing. So they ha- they're just 13 rogue Modrons that have escaped Mechanus and they're like, okay, you can live here as part of the library. And so they go and catalogue and shelve books, but they can only manage one book at a time. And I'm just oh, like, it's so adorable. I just, but in, oh. yet again, it's a two, it's, I think it's like three lines I'm looking at online. It's just three lines of text, but doesn't that imply that there's a portal to Mechanus somewhere, somewhere in the library? What's up with that? You know, the player's going to go there. Like, is stuff going to come back out? Where did these Modrons come from? Do they have an agenda? Is the, I can't remember what the the main controller of the the he's got a name, the first one or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Is unknown. he still connected to them? Are they mm. secretly trying to find a particular book? Maybe are, are, are they so are they going to are, are more of them going to come and try and take them back? And yeah, is is Mechanus going to come into this library? Yeah, all these things, and I'm like, this is amazing. <laughs> but, but I guess so, it gets yeah. for me. That's the sort of thing is that again, it's that throwaway line which you can say, um, you know, behind you, uh, there is a, a staff person comes comes around and you rec- you don't recognize it. It is a a construct of some sort, and you're like, well, I want to go over and talk to you. All oh, silent spells can't do anything about that, and they're like, <laughs> no. So yeah, just everything about that. You could, I guess, for me because obviously I love Modrons. But having that as a throwaway line and maybe it's something like the players never explore. I I, I mean, I, I as a DM, I'll be like, oh, but I want you to explore, but I have, maybe I have to keep hold that back. But I love this, that there's so much in that, that little paragraph where I'm like, I could do something with that. So I love that, the, the way it sort of inspires little ideas and stuff. So Yeah, I wonder if, I, I haven't read the rest of the Candlekeep book, but did they write this section and then give it to the people to write one shots or did the people write one shots and then someone included Modrons. And so they had to be like, Oh, I guess we've got to include a line about that in the general description. Mm, I actually don't know, to be fair. I actually don't know at all. I, as, as far as I'm aware, and I'm sure this is where listeners would be like, Oh, you, you didn't do any research for this. And I'm like, well, I've read about candle keeps. That's as far as I got. <laughs> um, but it was people from the D and D community who are quite big in their own right, either that they are writers or they are DMs and stuff. And they contributed a book, to the library so i think they always had this idea that this is like again like we were saying that's the idea of like you are at this place and you're given a quest and you go out and do it and retrieve this mm. book in some way as far as i believe it to be true but maybe again because it's not referred to really in the um sort of coast adventurers guide maybe it did it maybe did one of the writers did include and they're like well write that back in um oh in my head, I'm, I I hope Modrons were always there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they should just start including Modrons in every single piece of content from here on oh, out oh in no. a kind of seeding a big overarching story that it turns out the Modrons have been visiting all realities, <laughs> all planes. <laughs> you imagine that would be incredible. And yeah, like I said, so there are other bits and pieces. There is obviously a map which you can have a look at as a player. I think the most important thing to say is that there is... This sort of this we've sort of referred to it on and off, but this sort of courtyard of air, which is a huge courtyard with not much in it, and then obviously you have stuff like a, a clothing shop, a you know the hearth, which is a tavern, and then access to these sort of twelve different towers, sort of uh, looking over the sort of the walls and stuff, sort of in the northwest, uh, sorry, the northmost point of this courtyard. But then there is something called this green emerald door, which you are not allowed past if you are just a a normal person visiting. Candle keep, you have to get explicit permission to get access to this. And this is where obviously the avowed stayed, or there's more the sort of the maybe the darker, deeper books that are found. So if I get proper 
uh, Forbidden Library vibes from this point onwards. And I like this idea that here's the here's what's access, accessible to the public who've already paid a hefty fine to get in. And then you need something even more, which is a written permission slip from one of the great uh, readers or even from the Keeper of the Tomes themselves. So going into that and then looking at, again, very, very short descriptions of places. So is it Exaltation? This sort of this mm, bastion, the uh, the sort of like basically where the avowed live, and you know they have stuff like again for me it feels a bit like Hogwarts. You've got like classrooms, kitchens, bakeries, all that sort of thing. So places where the avowed sort of stay, and there's like a certain schedule where you're like oh there's food, you know, bringing the bells and stuff like that, and it must be huge, and it just includes so much more. And, it, and there's only like a small paragraph on that, so. I like that idea that all the in, all the real info stuff is obviously where the players can get in, but like, but there's a door we can't get into. It's we must, a, it's a, must go. <laughs> it's a bit of a catch twenty two, I think, because they they I think they wrote this because they wanted the structure to have these one shots where you go away from Candlekeep and, and go away, the yeah. book and bring it back. Mm-hmm. And so they had to make it this way that you don't get beyond that emerald door. But what a you know, as a player. I'm just going to want to get beyond that door. All I'm going and, and I'm and maybe not straight away, but I'm going to be thinking, okay, I'm only doing this because eventually I want to go in there and see what it's all about, exactly, and, and find out the, the the mysteries of Candlekeep, not the ones that they're sending me on. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. But, or even or even if you're playing like a an evil campaign or anything like that, where your your mission is to be infiltrate Candlekeep to get there must mm-hmm. be something behind that door, and yet you're playing along, getting all these things, and like, no, one day I'll get closer to it, and it turns out. Oh no, the knowledge was with you all along. That sort of <laughs> the only thing I would say about the Emerald Door, which was a little surprising, is that they 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 put that the the letter of admittance can be forged. You just need to contest a keeper's who's going to check the letter there, insight check versus your dexterity deception mm-hmm. to to create the forgery, which felt like quite a small thing. Mm. After all these defenses and wards and magical powers, for it to come down just to that single check was a, a little surprising. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it does describe that the letter needs to have a wax seal and needs to uh, contain certain information. So I feel like um, I feel like it shouldn't just say that it could be forged with a deception check because because no. you shouldn't be able to forge a seal. That's the whole point. Mm. So you need to maybe have a mission to go and get a copy of that seal secret yeah. or something. Yeah, I, like it that. feels like you'd have to do a lot of research to make sure it is a spot on mission, which sounds like a mission in itself. And then to get there and be like, oh, <laughs> I could have probably flown over as a bird or something. Like <laughs> The last thing that they throw in, in at the end there, yes. what is Mirim the Sentinel worm? Good, what is good all question. that about? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So again, this, I think, which possibly your players will never discover, and only you know about this idea that the silver dragon, Mirim, broke into Candlekeep and um, was you know, intent of adding all the books to her hoard. And she got bound into service by a an archmaid uh, to say like, well, you need to pay for this stuff. <laughs> um, and unfortunately the wizard passed away before the sentence was served and no one has been able to break this enchantment as a result. Whilst time passes away, the corpse obviously disintegrates, but now we have this sort of spiritual dragon that is sort of underneath Candlekeep that will, you know, it's, it will happily sort of like, you know, guard the books and stuff and then come to the aid of Candlekeep should it need to. But that's the idea that this conversationalist, as it's described in this book, this is like, oh, hello, how is the outside? You know, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's so weird that it starts, and you read the description, it starts making it sound like a villain. This yeah. dragon broke in, intent on adding its riches to a horde. And then by the end, I guess over time, now that they're dead and just a spectral ghost, it's like they just want to have a chat. They just want to hear about the outside world. They've been trapped here for thousands of years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess because it, yeah, it's silver dragons, so metallic dragons are uh, good in that way so it is it but i guess it's just like something oh well i'm well i want this this is mine now i've taken i've chosen it as my thing but yeah it does sound like well this is this is awful but it just shows that candlekeep has these powerful things and can even turn enemies so to say into allies and yeah and yeah looking at her stat block as well you like you know, got all the stuff of a dragon but yeah can't leave candlekeep regeneration regains 40 hit points at the start of her turn that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I didn't feel much fancy fighting it. And I think the table would tell you that you'd need 519th level, 520th mm. level, something like that to, yeah. to from, stand a chance. Previous, so. Yeah, because it's challenge rating 22 there. Yeah. And 
Yeah, all two different breath weapons as well. So yeah, cold and necrotic. Oh, free, sorry. Pra paralyzing breath. Wow. So going dying obviously makes you <laughs> even stronger, I guess. And yeah, it's just a very interesting creature, which I think makes total sense to bring it out as a Again, the idea we said like you go on a couple of missions. Oh no, something's happening to Candlekeep. Oh, we are being uh, uh, sieged in some way, right? Bring her out, you know, like call up. Yeah, I definitely uh, don't envy anyone who's trying to infiltrate Candlekeep with a challenge rating twenty two <laughs> monster <laughs> like this sitting on the inside. Yeah, it'll be a proper big boss battle. But again, maybe some of these one shots in here will will talk about that as well. Maybe like a siege of some sort or something like that. On um, the note of stat blocks, the one thing that I mm -hmm. did want to mention yes. that I, it, it, you know, it's actually the only thing I'd heard about Candlekeep before reading really? this. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, yeah, was because someone told me about it. Why does the Master Sage have fireball when there is specifically a rule that says any fire, including <laughs> that that comes from a fire-based spell, is immediately oh. extinguished? <laughs> How funny! I had not, I had not clocked that. That's so funny. Is is that the only fire thing they have? There's there's also reference to continual flame in one of the chambers deep inside, but continual flame as a spell is just aesthetic. It doesn't have any heat and it can't catch fire. Mm -hmm. But they gave the Master Sage actual literal fireball as their so their funny. one like powerful spell. <laughs> so I don't know why. Yeah, and you get you do that three times a day. So I guess it's like, no, stop a villain, and you, you wait till they get to the gates past the villain, and then you just go <laughs> constant yeah, just, fireballs. <laughs> just get outside and then I'll cast fireballs. Right. But well, then of course if they're in the bloody um the, the the towers as well, there's silence. So again, it's like shouting after them and like having to use like symbols like it's that person, <laughs> get them. <laughs> like, <Yes. laughs> Oh, oh yeah, maybe the maybe they avowed all have a sign language that they can use to communicate with each they, other. They must have something like that, just being able to like indicate. Like definitely, I think they have message. There's, there's, they've got message to talk to someone. So yeah, so again, we sort of bypass this a little bit. But when you're giving a book to someone, so the, there's there's someone on the gate. It's like, oh, very nice. And where did you get this? And as they're doing it, they're reporting to someone, going, okay, this is it's like 200 pages. It's just is it in the big Excel spreadsheet? And so someone going, hang on, yes. So like, okay, this is lovely, but. We've already got it. So you're like, no. <laughs> Proper antiques roadshow s. But there's like someone behind the scenes going, shit, shit, shit. Where is it? You know, trying to use all the magicals. Maybe asking a modron, like, couldn't you find it? You know, but yeah, I guess I, I I would imagine that they have some sort of hand signals or something like that if they can't actually speak. So be interesting. Oh. A wonderful setting. A, a really. Oh, thank you. Well, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> I guess yeah. Like I said, it's just the idea of having somewhere which is really interesting and has these secrets and stuff, but is at its best a day-to-day -day building that people try and get into. Like, I imagine it to be, you could have this as almost like a, maybe like an emissary, perhaps, uh, embassy, sorry. You could have it as like any sort of like uh, council building or anything like that. Just, ha just having stuff like this, which is, you know, either big or small, you can just have it and it has some secrets in it. And just I like that as a sort of template that you can do to make your own interesting buildings that you are attached to that aren't necessarily the tavern. Ben, thank you so much for coming with me on a journey into Candlekeep. <laughs> um, My pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. Um, where can we find you? What are you up to? Any exciting projects on the horizon? Uh, you know, just living my life. Yeah. Um, I, I sometimes stream on Twitch at The Pickle Farm, <laughs> but so rarely that it is, you'll probably find that I haven't streamed in two months by the time you open that. Otherwise... <laughs> I might put something up on the DMs Guild that you, you suggested I do last time we recorded. Yes, please. So, um, maybe look my name up there, probably under Pickle Farm as well. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. That's uh, everything oh, these days. No, yes, it uh, is your brand now. Uh, uh, you've said it, oh, so yes. it has to be true. <laughs> <laughs> now I've said it. Now it's out there. Now it's out there. And uh, to finish off, my name is Fiona. I, I run the DMs. I run. I do run the DMs book club. I'll start that What's again. That? <laughs> <laughs> What's that? That's what you've just listened to. Um, my name is Fiona, and I run the What Am I Rolling podcast. That other project I do, um, which is a twice monthly RPG one shot podcast. As always, it's going very well. There are more mm. one shots coming out. Yeah, yeah, going well. Yeah, going well. Well, Ben, you and your partner were on it. 
a little while ago. We, we played, were? Yes, you played Mouse Guard, uh, which was like the burning, it, it, it's some sort of burning wheel ad- adaptation. Uh, no, I can't remember what I can't remember what the system is now. It's been so long ago, but it was really fun. We had a, a lot of good fun, and that yeah, was fun. I, I encourage any listener to go find that uh, Mouse, Mouse Guard one shot. I think it was two episodes. I think mm-hmm. I listened to it when it came out because obviously there's a little bit of bleed time between recording and, and publishing. It was over a so year, yeah. <laughs> it was it was over a year. It was pre-pandemic recording, post-pandemic yeah. release. Yeah. Um, and that was it was an absolute pleasure to listen to it again because it was such good fun and yeah. a wonderful DM. Oh, but you were wonderful players for that as well, because this idea of having uh, mice in a huge strange land just doing little things like delivering the mail, which is what you were doing. So so does that. And because I forgot to talk about it last time, we do have an offer code for First Space Gaming, which is essentially your local game shop, uh, where I'm originally from in Burnley, which you can get 10% off your first order with them. And that can be anything like RPG books. It could be terrain, whatever you fancy. Uh, if you're in uh, mainland UK, though. So sorry, Ben. Possibly not. <laughs> Maybe over Christmas I can get something. Absolutely, yeah. So to get that, you just type into the uh, the coupon at uh, checkout uh, DMBC to get 10% off your first order. And with that, Ben, thank you so much for your time on this podcast as a guest host. I really appreciate it. And no doubt we will come back for more exciting things, I'm sure. So until then, folks, thank you so much for listening. And we will speak to you, listen to you, see you next time. Yes, that'll do. Bye. Bye.